foreign journalists are leaving China as Beijing becomes more hostile to the Western press. We talked to one of them, ABC correspondent Bill Bertels. Then we'll tell you about how Taiwan is debating the best way to reopen travel links with China. And Taiwan is also considering whether or not to extend its military conscription period. This is Taiwan Insider. Welcome to the show. Many foreign journalists based in China have complained that the country is becoming increasingly difficult to report from. In their recent annual report, the Committee to Protect Journalists says that China is jailing a record number of journalists. The country is actually jailing the second highest number of journalists in the world. Even former Australian Broadcasting Corporation China correspondent Bill Bertels had to practically escape from China when Australia-China ties were at a new low. Australian authorities were concerned that the Chinese government might try to detain Bertels, the way that the Chinese government did back in 2020 when they detained the Australian Chinese reporter Cheng Lei. Natalie spoke to Bertels about the kind of difficulties that foreign correspondents face when reporting out of China. They got more difficult um, from initially when I was back there in 2015 for the ABC. It wasn't that difficult at the time. Of course, you never get access to anybody in power, but you could interview uh, academics and sort of advisors to the government. Uh, you could get access to big private companies like uh, Didi Chuxing and Wanda, and um, these sorts of companies would be happy to, uh, as they say, cooperate with the foreign media because they have a good story to tell. But certainly in the last couple of years, uh, 2019, 2020, by the time I left, it was getting more and more difficult because just overall there was a sense that the foreign media was hostile to China. This idea was continually perpetuated by the Communist Party. And we've seen since I've been gone, we've seen in the last year or two, uh, some pretty nasty incidents where when foreign journalists turn up for flood coverage in Hernan, you have the Communist Party Youth League putting out social media posts telling everybody if they see foreign journalists to report them to the police, uh, people surrounding foreign journalists and accusing them of being biased. Um, there's just a, a nastiness now to it. And we also see that through the, the state media uh, in, in the way it uh, continually attacks uh, the BBC, uh, CNN, basically anyone. So I, I did see, but just before I left, that even doing the more simple things that you do for television, such as standing on the street, and doing reporting, uh, that increasingly you would have people going past and calling the cops on you. Uh, and this is in downtown Beijing as well. So by all accounts, the environment for the foreign media in China has only deteriorated even further. And the last thing to add, of course, is that COVID has been used as an excuse to limit journalist visas uh, and to limit the travel for journalists in China. So it looks like a pretty, pretty dire situation at the moment. Bertels also shared his perspective on whether the Chinese public has generally turned negatively against foreign journalists. You know, you don't want to generalize and say everybody. There are plenty of cynics in China who, who see exactly what's going on. But it's a critical mass thing, isn't it? I think the best comparison to understand it for an audience outside China is the Trump campaign in the United States, where from an early on, uh, early point, uh, Donald Trump uh, stigmatized the media as being out to get him. And he created conditions where his supporters decided to reject and ignore any reporting about him from uh, most elements of the media uh, because he'd already uh, inculcated this idea in people's heads that the media is always lying. It's always out to get me. So it can't be trusted. It's hostile. You know, they're the enemy. They're the enemy of the people, as Trump once said. Now, this is very, very similar playbook to how the Chinese Communist Party operates when it comes to the foreign media. Basically putting out the idea from the first place, and we saw this back in you know 2008 when the Olympics were on, it's not a new idea, but this constant uh, repetition through state media, through WeChat channels, that the foreign media is hostile, that they are hostile foreign forces, and it's out to get China. They always like to say, Mohei Zhongguo, Georgia, Mohei Zhongguo, slander China, uh, this is just constant repetitive messaging from the Communist Party uh, to the population in China. And uh, if you repeat something enough, it becomes uh, a standard idea. And, and you'd see this when you do simple things like box pops. You're on the street and um, you've got a camera and people are walking by and, you know, you're sort of saying, hi there, where, where were the Australian media? Can we ask you about 
uh, you know, what are your plans for Chinese New Year with COVID? You know, are you worried? Are you planning to leave the city? Something really politically benign. And increasingly, we saw people say, foreign media, no, nah, not talking to you. And we even had people report us to police and security guards multiple times. So that's the best way to understand it. It's the same tactic that the Trump campaign uses to stigmatize the media. And I, I don't think everybody in China, of course, buys into this, but certainly it would be my casual observation that the majority of people kind of do. And those who are kind of cynical about this, at the very least, it has a chilling effect where they know if they engage with the foreign media, if they accept an interview with BBC, then you're going to have Wu Mao and, uh, and um, all the little pinks, the um, Xiaofen Hong, getting online and attacking them and saying, you Hanjian, you traitor, why are you speaking to the BBC? It's a pretty toxic environment. Bill Bertels moved to Taiwan earlier this year and is now the ABC's East Asia correspondent. So taking all this into consideration, do you think that you would want to be a journalist in China, Itamar? You know, honestly, I think I would, because even though it might be becoming more dangerous and there are a lot of problems in reporting out of China, I still think that being a foreign correspondent in China is arguably the most important media job in the world because China is becoming increasingly important and the confrontation between especially the United States and China continues to heat up. And it's especially in this moment that we really need to know what's going on in China. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really admirable and important that we have journalists that are as committed as you and as Bill Bertels that are you know, willing to work in China and make sure that the public still knows what's happening there. Although foreign journalists have been leaving China, many are looking to travel between Taiwan and China, especially ahead of the Lunar New Year. Now, Taiwanese officials are considering how to reopen these routes. Debate continues as to when and how travel connections between Taiwan's outlying islands and China's Fujian province, known as the Three Mini Links, will be reopened. This is especially true because the Lunar New Year holiday is just over a month away. Jinmen County legislator Chen Yu-jen has expressed concern that delaying a decision makes things difficult, especially for people returning to Jinmen for the Lunar New Year. Head of the National Security Council, Wellington Ku, stated that a decision will definitely be made before the holiday. However, there have been concerns about reopening the links with China. Central Epidemic Command Center leader Victor Wang said that it is very difficult to assess the epidemic situation in China and how it will impact the outlying islands. He cautioned that it would be best to open the links in stages in order to maximize safety and control any outbreaks. Some experts have suggested that the islands should first open to those with Taiwanese nationality. Whatever the decision, everyone is hoping that the Lunar New Year celebrations will be safe. Extending military conscription is a hot topic in Taiwan. Now authorities say an official extension decision will be out by the end of the month. The government is expected to announce that compulsory military service will be extended from four months to one year. Defense Minister Chiu Guozheng stated publicly earlier this month that the government will likely make the announcement before the end of the year. In addition to public support, the move has also been applauded by other members of government and civil society groups. Current Minister of the Veterans Affairs Council and former Defense Minister Feng Shiquan stated that four months is too short to train a combat-ready soldier. Some experts have stated that the quality of training also needs improvement. They say that aspects of training, such as an emphasis on bayoneting drills, are outdated and do not reflect modern security concerns. Thus, they have suggested that training should be more specialized in areas such as cybersecurity. And now, here are some other stories that are on our radar. Deputy Health Minister Victor Wong urges citizens against bulk buying the popular painkiller brand Panadol and sending it to China amidst a shortage. The sudden shortage has been attributed to rising COVID-19 cases in both Taiwan and China. Wong says authorities are evaluating whether other measures need to be taken, such as restricting purchases. Taiwanese authorities are investigating whether the social media platform TikTok is illegally operating a business office in the country. Reports say TikTok's owner, ByteDance, has set up an office in Taichung based on suspicious activities. The company, however, says they have not established any legal entities in Taiwan. 
The winter solstice is here, which means most Taiwanese people are staying warm by eating glutinous rice balls known as tang yuan. But some Zhanghua residents are doing it differently, choosing to eat mochi, or glutinous rice cakes instead. Tang yuan must be cooked and eaten on the same day, whereas mochi can be kept for longer. Regardless, mochi and tang yuan shops are expected to have long lines this winter season. And we are back. Well, with Christmas coming up on Sunday, I thought a good final question might be to ask the two of you, what is one of your favorite holiday memories? It doesn't have to be Christmas related. It can be basically open to any holiday you want. Yeah, I, I guess I'll start. Okay. We're a little, I guess, over a week before we enter the new year. So my answer was a fireworks. Ooh, mm. nice. So I think, you know, Taiwan, ever since we, um, built the Taipei 101 that's been where a lot of people go to watch the fireworks and that's where I think I've made a lot of memories with my family watching the fireworks um, and doing the countdown. So you all go together like in that area or do you live close to there? I know some people like they can see it from their house which is pretty cool. Yeah so um, I was lucky enough that my parents live in an area that's close enough so mm -hmm. then we just head to the rooftop. Oh, oh, that is so nice. So That's lucky. perfect. Yeah, I tried to see it for the first time last mm -hmm. year. Like, I've lived in Taiwan for four and a half years now. This is the last year was the first time I tried to see it. But like when the fireworks went off, then there was all this smoke. It was like a very cloudy night, so then yeah. I like, couldn't see anything. It really depends on mm -hmm. like which side of 101 yeah, you stand at. Yeah, yeah. Because I think the wind blows in one di direction, and then that's it for you. Would you all do like New Year's barbecues? Because like the only time I ever saw the fireworks was I was at the Jinlong River, which is mm. like in Songshan District. And a lot of people on New Year's, like they'll go like a ton of people will barbecue there. And it's, it's, you can perfectly view 101 from there. So it's just like they kind of do them together. Do, yeah. Have you ever done that? I have not done that. Mm. The only barbecue that I do is during Zongchoujie, mm. which mm -hmm. is like the full Mid autumn festival. Yeah, yeah. Mid -autumn Another festival. great holiday. Another <laughs> great holiday. <laughs> what about you, Itamar? Okay. My favorite uh, like holiday memory are latkes because um, yeah I don't celebrate Christmas uh, I'm Jewish and <laughs> so latkes a lot of people like they hear oh you're Jewish well you must eat lots of latkes it's not true <laughs> Jewish people only eat latkes one time during the year which is during Hanukkah and so my mom would make them every Hanukkah because in Hanukkah you're supposed to eat fried foods because of the mm. oil and the oil that lasted seven days. If you don't know the story, look it up. And um, so I love latkes. They're very delicious. Eat them with uh, sour cream. Eat them with applesauce. Yeah, I was really going to ask applesauce. I yeah. I'm not Jewish, but I have a lot of Jewish friends, and that's one of my childhood memories. Yeah, latkes I, and applesauce. I personally like it with applesauce. Um, I still make it in Taiwan every single year. Wow. Yeah, I usually Bring it to have... the office. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, mine is technically something also edible, but... I use it in a non-edible way. I oh. couldn't fit gingerbread house onto <laughs> it. I've never actually eaten a gingerbread house because I'm pretty no? sure the cookies, well, like if you get it from a box, like that box could have been on the shelf for years. Yeah. You never know how many Christmases have passed. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, my sister and I, when I lived in New York, had this tradition of making uh, gingerbread houses together and we would get kind of like a different kit every year. I remember one year we made um, like a Barbie gingerbread house. Like wow. th this was not when I was a little kid. I was like 20 or something <laughs> like, <we did> this <laughs> just for fun. And it came out really well. Like, I mean, I hear there's a Barbie movie coming out soon or something. So I'm expecting a call from the producers any day now. <laughs> for some inspiration for this gingerbread house. How do you dispose of a gingerbread house at the end of the um, holidays? Well, just like everything else in the U.S., just in the garbage and forget Aww. about it. <laughs> there goes your Barbie dreams. Yes. Yeah, well, anyway, on that note, uh, that is about all that we have time for today on this episode of Taiwan Insider. I'm Emma Banak. I'm Yamar Waxman. And I'm Brendan Wool. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And if you like our content, be sure to follow us on social media. Yeah, you could follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, Mastodon, uh, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> or even subscribe to our YouTube channel. Bye. Bye. Bye.